So thank you everyone for joining us today um, for our BGFS webinar in partnership with Highways England as part of Leeds Digital Festival. Um, today it's on transport versus data. So we are recording the session and we do want you to ask any questions that you might have through the Q&A functionality and we'll get a chance to go through them at the end. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Carl Austin who hosts today's session. Hey, thanks, Karen. And hey, everyone. Um, so I'm Carl. I'm a UK Chief Technology Officer at BGSS. Uh, and I'm also here with uh, Ian. Ian, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm Ian Gordon. I'm the Head of Data Architecture and Engineering here at Highways England. So uh, but both of us are going to speak a bit today about transport versus data. Um, apologies for the noise of the cats in the background. There's there's all this cool stuff we hear about, about transport in the future, mobility as a service, digital twins, all that kind of stuff. Uh, cars that drive themselves, sensors everywhere. We're going to talk about it, but you can't just go build that stuff. There's loads of foundations to put in place too. Um, unfortunately, that, that means you've got to put those foundations in place uh, in, in an infrastructure that, is, that, is, that moves at a different speed to digital. It's quite difficult in a civil engineering world, potentially, to do digital engineering. But as part of the work we've been doing, uh, BGSS and Highways together, we've broken through that and we want to talk a little bit about how we did that, some of the learnings we took along the way, and then all the cool stuff that you can do with it and the reasons that we're putting that in place. Um, if, you, if you want to put your hand up during it, feel free. Uh, we'll, we'll, we, we're happy to uh, answer any questions, but there'll be time for questions at the end. Uh, and without ado, I'll hand over to Ian. Yeah, so um, morning all, not morning, afternoon all. Um, we've decided to have a little bit of fun with this first slide to set the scene. And I've also made it as complicated as possible for, for Carl, who's operating the slide deck, um, just to give him a bit of a challenge. Um, so this is a very well and over, probably overused quote from Roy O'Mara. We tend to overestimate the effects of technology in the short run and underestimate it, the effect in the long run. I think that's kind of core to what we're talking about today is you know those of you that are working within the transport sector or the wider infrastructure sector it, it often feels like we're just around the corner from something magical happening and then the next day you go into work and you're still having conversations with people about access databases and, and spreadsheet chains and vba and that, that sort of thing so it always feels like you know the future quote unquote it's just a little bit out of reach um, there's obviously a huge amount of innovation work streams going on and that sort of thing. And again, it's really hard to get those things over the adoption life cycle and into use within our industry. It's a challenge that we've come perilously close to, to doing every over and over again and, and never quite made it. But I think there is something profound happening in the coming years and decades. And I think, you know, looking back on this time, we're hopefully going to see the seeds of, of what we've been investing in. And I think given that we know there's going to be this massive change in how our industry operates um, in the coming years, despite the challenges we face today, now is the time, as per that quote from Aaron Bastani there, you know, to, to figure out how we actually weave these solutions into, uh, into, the, into the fabric of modernity. And, you know, in this industry, we, we can do that much more literally than, um, than other parts of the world. You know, we have the opportunity to fundamentally change how members of the public experience their built environment experience the connectivity in their lives um, so that in and of itself is really exciting um, so talking about the future um, i had a word with the folks at google and they've they've been kind enough to give us a kind of beta alpha view of uh, a website they're working on which um, carl can open up right now so this is a uh, uh, mass that's mobility as a service .google .com. Um, it's still a little bit rough around the edges, as, as you can see, um, but it really starts to show you the kind of functionality that they're hoping to put on offer and, and, and will hopefully be on offer more widely in the near future. So if I click into mass.com, the first thing it asks me is, well, where do you, where do you want to go today, Ian? Um, so uh, let's see what happens. Can you click that, Carl? Is that coming up? There it is. Okay. So I have to decide whether I want to go home, uh, to work, or to the pub. Um, and again, the key thing here is it's not asking me what mode of transport I want to take or anything like that. It is just, just telling me kind of what, what my destination should be. It's probably a bit too early for the pub. 
Uh, so I'm going to go, I'm going to go to work because I'm sat in my home office, as I'm sure a lot of you are. So the next slide there is desired travel time. So, you know, time is money. Uh, I'm in a bit of a hurry, so I'm, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go quickly. Um, what's the next option? Oh yeah, well, we're in the middle of a pandemic. So it's a question of how worried I am about COVID. So in this instance, I'm going to be slightly reckless and say, I don't mind being in a vehicle with other people. That's, that's fine. I can, I can handle it. I'm, I'm willing to take that risk. Um, what's the next option? Oh yeah, how fancy do I want to be? What's my bling level? Yeah, you know, it's a work travel, so I'm not really worried about showing off to anyone at the moment. So I'm, I'm happy to go on the, on the lame setting there. So let's see what kind of option it gives me. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna be in a carpool. That's fine, I can handle that. That's, that's not gonna be too bad. It'll get me there. It gets me there quickly, and, and that's the main criteria I have. Um, so as I said, perhaps a, a deliberately silly <laughs> example, here, but I think what it what, what it's trying to get at is, you know, as an infrastructure organization, you, you know, what we expose to the customer is increasingly going to not be about our infrastructure, which is a bit of a change in mindset. It's about what service do we offer to the public, and 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 increasingly that service that we offer to the public it isn't about a particular means of transport. It's about fundamentally connectivity. Um, so in order for us as the infrastructure owners of Britain to be able to or, or offer this service to the public, we need to start thinking in a much more data focused way. And in particular, we need to get better at sharing information between, um, between organizations. You know, this, this kind of scenario is only possible with a clear kind of data model, data interfaces between Highways England. There's nothing really starts or ends on the strategic road network. There's always other networks involved. You know, and then organizations like Network Rail, TFL, and, and private organizations like Google and, and Uber and, and whoever comes up after them. So it, it's, it's, it's a silly example, but it, it's also indicative of we're in the business of data now, whether we like it or not. And the question is, how do we bring data services to organizations such as Highways England that, that aren't always that um, you know, adjusted to thinking about themselves as, as data focused organizations? So that takes us on to the next slide, which is kind of um, some work that we've been doing within Highways England um, to really try and express this visually. Um, so you can see what we're trying to do is, is connect customers to the physical assets, is, is make our roads available so that people can, can make their journeys, get where they want to go safely, conveniently, uh, and with minimal disruption. And, and the way we've done that in the past is through um, the asset lifecycle, which, which you can see in, in kind of... Uh, high level layout there, the, the standard like plan, design, construct, maintain, operate. It's what we've been doing for, well, in our case, uh, you know, decades, in the case of network rail, hundreds of years at this point. Uh, but what we're trying to change in, in this view is, is putting data at the center of that and, and crucially putting trusted data at the center of that. So if we zoom into this diagram, what we'll start to see is, is we start to see all the different stages that are involved in managing um, an organization like Highways England from an information perspective. All the tasks that make it possible for the road to be there when you need it, <laughs> basically. So you've got things like um, digital rehearsals, so making sure that you can construct things more effectively, you understand the kind of uh, interfaces with you know power networks and utilities and stuff, um, and indeed just different packages of work while you're, while you're building roads. Um, you know, you've got sophisticated scheduling tools, risk-based prioritization tools, all the way through to kind of incident response and decision support tools on the operation side. So this is kind of a vision um, of where we're going to get to, to as an organization in terms of our ability to leverage data to make data-driven decisions um, in order to augment what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And you can see at the center of that sits the data life cycle. So in order for the asset life cycle to work in this picture, we need a data life cycle that is there to support it at each stage of the journey. So this, this, this information model goes, there's different ways of interpreting it, but it goes through some pretty standard stages. You've got to specify information, collect it, collate it, evaluate it, and so forth. And if we zoom into that, um, we can start to see the tasks within the data world that are required in order to facilitate the, the asset world. So You've got people figuring out what kind of data you need. You've got people coming up with cost-effective, efficient ways of uh, collecting that information. Uh, and then you've got people further down the stream 
analyzing and, and using it and visualizing it and ultimately safely archiving and disposing of it so we're not holding more information than we, than we need and, and increasing our kind of information security exposure and and crucially uh, the, the slice of that life cycle that that i've been focusing my work on um, and, and that bgss have been assisting with is is that collation stage so it's how do we create a common data environment a single source of truth that goes across the many and various directorates and use cases and, and, and things you can see on that asset lifecycle and, and provides that common data repository. So that, that's what we've been building and it, it's creating that collation layer that makes our information accessible uh, and hopefully um, useful to people so that they, we can start making data-driven investment decisions. So there's, there's some unique challenges in creating that kind of holistic um, data architecture within, or, within a, a, an organization like Highways England. Um, part of that is just, it's, it's a very, traditionally a very siloed organization, so that the people at different points in the asset lifecycle haven't always been particularly good at sharing information between each other and haven't always had the tools at hand to enable them to do that. But I think one of the interesting things to explore today is whether there's actually just above that a more fundamental kind of mismatch of mindset you know, the, the transport sector and the infrastructure sector in general hasn't always had the best track record of implementing modern IT. We have, we have massive amounts of technical debt and it's very rarely about the intent and it's often not even about the level of investment. There's, there's clearly something more fundamental going on in the way that we approach these problems. I think many of you on this, uh, this conference will have been on those projects yourself. Um, I know I certainly have, where you've, you've been sat there thinking, we have all the tools and the money that we need in order to do this, and yet it's somehow not happening. So, so what's going on? Um, so if we, if we jump to the next slide, um, I think part of that means us, that we need to recognize that there's different cultures at play, you know, um, and that the culture within the management of infrastructure and transport organizations you are usually coming from a different place than the, the culture, you know, the CTOs of, of data organizations and, and system integrators and the like. Um, and hopefully by recognizing this culture, and that, that's certainly something that we've tried to, to approach in our work at Highways England, which Carl will take you into a lot more detail on later. Um, you know, by recognizing it, we can start to understand how we work around it a little bit. Um, so a very high level, you know, organizations like Highways England do not yet see themselves as predominantly data organizations. They are still predominantly people that build and maintain large bits of infrastructure. You know, that's what they take pride on. And, and as you go up the food chain within an organization like ours, you will typically come across a whole lot more engineers and, and quantity surveyors and the like than you will, you know, solution architects. It's changing, but you know, it, it's never going to change totally because you know, we've got, we've got a lot of money to spend over the next investment period and we're going to spend it on building stuff that's going to make the country work better. It's going to be supported by data infrastructure, but the predominance of the budget is going to be on the, on the concrete and the tarmac and all that sort of stuff. So right off the bat, no matter how big your data project is within an organization like this, it's always going to be dwarfed by the, the actual construction projects, often by an order of magnitude, two orders of magnitude, three or four orders of magnitude, depending on what, on what you're up to. Um, and that kind of has implications, you know, often data projects are managed um, on the same kind of uh, level of rigor as, as construction projects. Uh, and, and often that means that the governance in place for data projects just doesn't really fit data. And, and that is particularly true when you, when you look at that kind of comparison of the length of different projects. So um, construction projects tend to be very long, but once you've done them, they're done. Data projects tend to be a bit shorter, often much shorter, but there's always room to build a bit more, uh, you know, make your project, your data uh, projects and solutions a bit better incrementally over time. And that, that tends to be how solutions develop best in the data space, at least in my opinion. So again, if we start to treat data projects as big construction projects and expect them to deliver on a particular day a big bang that completely revolutionizes functionality, you're often setting yourself up for failure right away. Um, I remember uh, managing the development of uh, a control system for a large uh, mega project a couple of years ago. And because the governance didn't vary, 
for our type of project, we still had to do the exact same kind of Primavera, you know, waterfall management that all of the big main works contractors were doing, even though their budgets were, you know, multi-billion pounds and ours was multi-million pounds, we still ended up with a 14,000 line Primavera project plan that we couldn't manage. <laughs> um, even though that kind of thing's completely unnecessary in, in the data world. And um, I think that said, we got to recognize this, the different safety impacts. So there's, there's very few safety critical data projects and, and, and those that do exist possibly do need a bit more of that oversight. So we have, to, we have to recognize that, you know, a lot of the infrastructure and governance that exists in transport world exists because of the very real impact that we can have on people's well-being. Um, so again, it's just another thing to acknowledge and be ready for. I know that as a data person, I always struggle to come up with my safety moment at the start of every, um, of every team's meeting. Um, and it's something we need to get a bit better at, I suppose. I think the, the other implication is in, this, in the world of user support. So again, once you build a road, it's kind of there. Um, you got to maintain it, obviously, but you're not going to get a whole lot of calls to the service desk for a road. Um, whereas data projects um, are much more likely to have that long tail of people calling in and, and needing help and training and, and building capability in, in, order to, um, in order to make use of it and, and derive the benefit from it. And again, that's not something that transport organizations are always that good at thinking about because they're used to these big upfront CapEx projects where you build something, you have the ribbon cutting ceremony and then jobs are good and like we can move on. Um, I, I won't really, I think the, the rest of this is, is relatively self-explanatory. There's a, there's a big difference in how you design these products. Again, data goes more towards the incremental side of things, whereas you probably don't want to incrementally design a highway. Um, and then crucially at the end, there's that gap in knowledge, you know, we don't really know how to build bridges as data people, um, but similarly, um, it, when you're building a large infrastructure project, a lot of the know-how sits with the client, whereas in data, the client tends to be much less informed, and I'm including myself <laughs> in that in that group. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an area where we're much more reliant on our suppliers and getting value from our suppliers in order to achieve what we want to achieve. Uh, and that's, that sometimes works out really well and it, it sometimes doesn't, but you gotta recognize that mismatch. So jump into the next slide, kind of what we wanted to accomplish here was uh, to start to build a data platform that, um, that starts to marry that, to fill that gap. So the technology was deliberately simple, boring, you might say, um, and focused on sort of standard Microsoft analytics platform as a service tools in Azure. Um, what we really focused on was the adoption and the operational service. So operational service was getting an IT department that's weighed down by technical debt and legacy systems to be able to be comfortable supporting a modern cloud platform. That is a huge challenge. And, and it's not because anyone has, has bad intentions, it's just because it's a modal shift for organizations such as ours. And then on the adoption service, it's about going into, out into the business, talking to engineers, talking to operators, talking to project managers and helping them to understand how they can use cloud technology to, um, to do their work better. And crucially, how building capability within the infrastructure organization in a single place, rather than constantly shopping out little different bits of work to the supply chain, can actually result in a better overall outcome for everybody involved. So that's the service we've been working on and, and Carl's going to take you through some of this philosophy that we used to build that up. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to touch on three of the streams of work we, we undertook um, uh, with, with Highways to, to, to deliver this into, into their organization. We'll touch on Ontology's end-to-end -end technology platform and uh, the business change aspect. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the learnings we've done, we've got from this and from other projects like it, uh, if, you're, if you're intending to do something similar yourself. So uh, I'll move on to Ontology's. This is in the modeling space. So, to, to model the data across the whole of the highways domain is a, is a complex task. It's a very, very large data domain. Um, as, part of, as part of this work, we didn't just take the kind of classic entity relationship conceptual model approach to this. We built an ontology, um, ontology being a concept from philosophy. Uh, one of the key books that we read actually on, on building on ontology is written by three philosophers and can be a little bit of, a, of hard going at times. Uh, I might also add that one of, one of the uh, philosophers who wrote that book also wrote South Park and philosophy, philosophy respect my philosophy, which I found out today and uh, was somewhat amused by. But it's, it's effectively a formal definition of concepts, relationships and properties. Um, 
the important part there being the properties. Uh, unlike an ER model or something like that, uh, you can put properties attributes on relationships and the whole of the thing comes together and, and explains the semantics behind the name, basically. Um, so this also allows everyone and everything, every machine, to speak the same language of the data, which is a really, really key capability when you're looking to democratize data, especially across an organization with as wide a domain space as the highways. Um, so we, we took input from all across the, the Highways England business, uh, all the data that we've uh, collected and brought into this solution, which I'll go into in a bit, is all mapped to this ontology. Everything, like we've, we've formed a conceptual model from here, logical models, physical models, everything comes back to this ontology such that everything can speak that language. Um, whilst, whilst you might ask, what, why an ontology now if you're only using conceptual model effectively? Well, the ontology provides a great opportunity to understand the domain of your data, but it also represents a schema for a graph database potentially in the future. I know that when, when Ian and I spoke, uh, when we first started on this project, part of Ian's uh, and, and Highway's roadmap is to have a graph database. Uh, the, the data they store is, it, it really fits with that type of model. And, and as we move forward, things like knowledge stores that, um, and, and uh, artificial intelligence that can actually understand the knowledge you have within your business is going to need that type of representation to work. So why not define your model as an ontology from the start? Uh, the other thing mentioned briefly at the beginning is digital twins. Uh, a graph data store is a core piece of the digital twin puzzle. Uh, if you don't know what digital twins are or what that means, then Ian's going to explain that a little bit later as well. Um, the other thing to note about this ontology is it's publicly available. Uh, if you're going to define a domain in a way that everybody can speak the same way about that domain, then you need to make it available to everybody. And uh, I think that's a wonderful thing that, that's, that's been done here. Um, so what does that ontology look like? Um, honestly, a little bit of a mess. <laughs> uh, from a human point of view, it's, it's very, very hard to, to, to comprehend on, on that entire scale. However, if you zoom into a little bit there, you can kind of see that much more interpretable version of it. And obviously at the large scale, that's exactly what you want the machines to be able, uh, a machine to be able to interpret kind of all of that information about the domain. Um, uh, it's much more consumable for a human when it's filtered. This is an example from, uh, if, I don't know, some of you may have attended uh, a talk that some others, uh, some of my colleagues did on ontologies earlier, earlier in the festival. This is, this is from the article that I wrote and probably from that talk as well. Um, which kind of filters in and, uh, and shows you how the human, you know, it can be consumed by humans in smaller parts of the domain. Um, so as well as building an ontology, we developed an end-to-end -end platform, that really boring technology bit that Ian talked about. Thanks very much. Uh, personally, I think it's quite interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm quite a fan of, uh, of, of data technology. Uh, so we built uh, a, a data architecture platform uh, a solid, solid core developed in Azure, delivered in Azure, kind of cloud, fully cloud native data platform, which honestly I believe is the only way to go nowadays. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to have said goodbye to the days of Hadoop uh, on-prem or in infrastructure as a service in the cloud. It was honestly a very, very horrible thing. And I can say that from working in it for many, many years, uh, from very early on. Uh, it made things very difficult and uh, the operation of a, of a Hadoop on your own terms is, is, a, is a tough thing to do. However, the cloud native technologies in this space have really revolutionized how simple it can be to deliver genuinely large scale data programs and projects. Obviously technology isn't the only bit, but removing that complexity is a, is a, is a key benefit. So yeah, we built it around the Azure data, the, the Azure kind of data ecosystem. You, you'll see things like data lake storage, the Azure Databricks service there, data factory, uh, Synapse Analytics, Power BI. Uh, it's all a really, really nicely integrated stack that we, we delivered this on top of. Um, it supports the, the, the idea, obviously this isn't just about putting data in a place. It supports the, it will support the use cases uh, are many across highways from democratized access to make business and investment decisions on um, through to uh, through to machine unit, use, uh, machine learning use cases, things like uh, identifying objects in the road, flooding, um, even how to, you know, even machine learning capabilities that tell you how to respond to incidents when they occur. In this environment, we already have tens of billions of rows of data ingested. Uh, with many, many more billion to come. Um, 
and actually the ease at which you can get that scale of data into something like this is is really really impressive so that i think one of the interesting things not just in the technology uh, is is how we deliver that technology we're big believers in the data ops culture uh, much like devops is to software delivery we believe that you should be able to apply automation and uh, and sort of delivery rigor to the field of data and data pipelines just like you can to software engineering and in this case we brought in uh, we brought in fully automated testing fully automated infrastructure uh, that that applies to data pipelines too um, not just not just the uh, not just uh, that the infrastructure itself or any code, but the actual pipelines we're delivering. We've got full CI and CD. It's uh, secure by design, secure security built in from day one. And in the MVP we built of this alone, there were 400 releases during that time. It shows you that kind of really, really um, fast iterative uh, approach to the technology in this space, which honestly would never have been possible prior, prior to that some of the cloud capabilities we have now. And kind of, uh, finally, on, 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 my, on, on the, the bit about what we've done here is business change. Many, uh, many people think of data as IT and data, but there's a huge part of business change involved as well. Um, we've already seen this diagram about the, the adoption and operational services that, uh, that have been delivered. I just noticed there's a Q&A. Any advice on how to decide cloud platform? What ask? Question. What factors help you choose Azure over AWX? Um, so th there's multiple factors involved. Obviously, one of them is going to be what your organizational strategy here, here is. Uh, I don't, like Ian, I believe the org, like, uh, Highways has adopted as your, uh, I believe that's correct, Ian? Um, we're, we're technically cloud uh, agnostic, but um, we've definitely, you know, we're an Office 365 organization and, and we've definitely got a lot more familiarity. Um, an existing practice within Azure, so that made the decision a bit easier than it would otherwise be. There's also, uh, they're also, for me, AWS Azure offer slightly different things in the day space. Azure offers a more combined ecosystem, uh, an ecosystem that integrates well across all the different tools and uh, admittedly has some very powerful data ops capabilities in its Azure DevOps tool set as well. Whereas uh, AWS offers some very powerful data capabilities, maybe a little less pre-integrated, but probably uh, potentially offer more power when uh, integrated by yourself together. So there's kind of slightly different um, aspects from the technical point of view and there's multiple aspects from the commercial point of view as well. Uh, so, yes, so business change. Let me just uh, remove that. Levels of service design. So yeah, we, we um, the team, some of whom are on, are on this, I, I believe, uh, the, the team did an ex excellent job of looking at those adoption and operation services and then breaking them down into full service blueprints, going you know, from a user point of view, exactly what are the services that we're offering? What, are the, what is the journey through those services? What do we need to deliver to deliver on that journey and solve the pain points of users who will, will have been used to multiple different data silos across the organization and difficulties accessing data all in one place and most importantly use that information to build something that supports people's use and operation of the platform here the, i've got uh let me just focus my screen there we've got an example here um this is of the the highways uh, sharepoint page this is for data as a service, and it provides a, a springboard for users of the data of, of the service, whether they're onboarding their projects, whether they're onboarding data, whether they want access to Power BI or Synapse, or they're a data scientist in the organization and want access to the raw data lake itself. This provides them uh, um, full details on how to do every one of those bits. It provides contacts into the organization of where they should go, and it's constantly updated by the team and provides an excellent just a really powerful resource to ensure that adoption of the platform is, is, is really gained. So that's the kind of three, there's three of the work streams that we worked on during this delivery. I wanted to go over a few of the, the learnings we've taken from this and multiple others, uh, multiple other pieces of work like this. Um, and a uh, shameless plug here, uh, We've written, up a, we've written these up in a white paper at uh, bjss.com forward slash data paper. Feel free to go and grab it. There'll be a lot more information than I go through in, the, in, a, in a few minutes here. 
So the first of these uh, aspects that we feel is really important to these type of programs, and, and these aren't just things where we've had success, they're things where we've had success where I and we have seen failures doing uh, anti-patterns in these spaces before effectively. So delivering value, it sounds so simple. It sounds like how could you have an anti-pattern that is not to deliver value? Well, the truth is that m many people delivering kind of large data platforms kind of forget about this one a little bit sometimes and, and spend a lot of time bringing all the data in, perfecting all the data before they're really looking at what the value of that data is and how to, how to generate that value. Um, we, we're big believers in you, you should be looking at delivering value all the way through. It, it, you can apply some of the things, some of, some of the principles from agile uh, delivery to data platforms. Uh, and you shouldn't just be, uh, shouldn't just be waiting a year or two until your data is modeled to deliver that. For example, at, at Highways, uh, the team has been working alongside a data science team who, who, are all, who are constantly looking at the data, experimenting, forming proof of concepts and taking them beyond that point into uh, to, to solve problems and, and generate benefits for Highways England. Um, thinking holistically, we touched on the, we've touched on business change and how important that is, modeling. It's not just about tech, it's not just about data, it's about user needs, outcomes, governance, how it fits into your business. If you deliver a data solution like this in an IT platform, it's not gonna work. Uh, there's a reason that Gartner, I think 85% of these type of projects don't succeed. Um, so these are, some, these are some of the questions that, that uh, what one of our service designers who works on this project um, state is the type of things that you, you, you typically want to ask when you're doing one of these programs. And I really like them, so I've, I've picked a few out here. You kind of want to ask yourself, what questions are people in the business trying to answer with data? Why? Um, how will they turn that data into information? What context do they need around the data? How will this be provided to them? And how will they actually understand that context and that data? How will people turn that information into action? How will it improve the outcomes and, and impact on your organization? How will people discover, access and use data in the platform? How do you make it easy for them to do that? What kind of support will they need? And how will the existence and value of the platform be communicated to people? Uh, uh, you can build the best thing, uh, but unless you communicate it effectively internally and show people why they need to use it and, and, and show people how it benefits them, it doesn't necessarily gain adoption. Um, and these kind of answers allow you to focus on your user needs and understand the changes you need to make to support your, uh, your delivery. The next one is steel threading. Um, in agile delivery, there's this, this idea that you can deliver a thread through your software that delivers real value and iterate from there. We believe this works really well with data platforms and times in, it kind of ties into the delivering value point. Um, you can take a steel thread of your platform, governance, uh, data ingest, uh, and, and value realization and build it. And by doing that, the side effect is you'll build some of the core pieces of your data program. For example, you pick a use case, you model and onboard just the data for that use case. You implement the necessary governance around that data. You implement the parts of the platform that are needed to, to, make, to, to realize that use case and then realize the use case itself and implement it into your business. And effectively by doing that, you've done a, a piece of everything that's needed and you've built out uh, a minimum viable aspect, a minimum viable governance, minimum viable platform that you can continue on from. Uh, Serverless technology, um, I've, I've kind of already covered this one with, uh, with, with the Hadoop point, but um, serverless has taken this even further. There are now multiple uh, data capabilities in AWS and Azure that are either entirely serverless or moving towards there. Things like um, Data Factory in Azure or AWS Glue um, for ETL, and even Databricks is going serverless uh, in Azure. Um, it's part, part of the way there already, and, and, I, and I'm sure they have plans to go, to go fully, fully serverless at some point in the future. I highly recommend using that technology as much as you can. And then we've already touched on data ops too, but I, I just wanted to reinforce the importance of, of that, bringing that rigor in. Uh, it, it brings additional quality, but it also brings additional speed. Um, and now, given that, I want to hand over to Ian for the last, uh, interesting bit oh the cool bit so I, I guess this is like the reward you get for being a good data person um for figuring out all the organizational and cultural challenges for for doing your data ops properly for building a, a scalable platform and driving adoption and capability within the business 
then you get to do some fun stuff, right? If you try and do it the other way around, which I'm sure you've all seen from time to time, it doesn't go so well. Um, but this is the way that we can do cool stuff whilst also like actually delivering value for, for the taxpayers, really. So um, we talked earlier about mobility as a service. Um, digital twins are another um, kind of buzzword these days. Um, but ultimately, mobility as a service and digital twins, at least in this space, kind of need to be the same thing in order to provide this kind of flat view of connectivity across the country you need that kind of model of how the physical infrastructure works not exclusive to highways england but across all of the different networks of networks that, that make it possible not just the kind of trains and the roads but also the the power systems and the telecommunication systems that allow you to to make those things work um nobody has thought more about this than the center for digital built britain and um, if you haven't read their flourishing systems paper um it's not very long and it is very pretty um, so I highly recommend it, um, and I've stolen liberally with some of their permission uh, some of these images because I think they're really compelling. So that diagram on the right is as good a description as you're going to get in a picture of what a digital twin is. It's a it's a digital representation of a of a physical asset, and I like to take that definition a little bit further and say it's a digital representation that you can query. And, and preferably one that doesn't just show how it's built, but more importantly, um, shows how it operates in the real world under real circumstances, because that's what allows you to actually, you know, do scenario planning and testing of, of how your assets are going to behave and your operations are going to behave under duress. Um, so if we jump to the next slide, there's another diagram from the CDVB, and I think that really lands this point. I was really delighted when I saw um, this uh, image because for some of the reasons I went to, into earlier, the, the preponderance of, of development in this space and often the preponderance of, of kind of um, excitement in this space often centers around building the assets and all the clever digital stuff you can do while you build assets. And that's important, don't get me wrong, BIM is really cool, digital twins moving into that space is really cool. But the CDBB recognized that the value to the public is the 99 point X percent of assets that are not currently under construction. It's the infrastructure that we built 20, 30, 50 years ago, and, and now we need to continue to get value from under you know in, increasing pressure. You know, I always think about Blackfriars Station and, and Network Rail and Thameslink trying to run 24 trains per hour through that one little bridge over the Thames. And that just shows me, you know, the extremity of, of how we're pushing our infrastructure within this country by necessity. Um, and the importance of using digital technologies in general and digital twins specifically to, to help us um, operate and maintain those assets as effectively as possible. Um, so it, it, as the CDBB says there, taking a people focused view, what are the outcomes that we want society to derive from our infrastructure and what's the right combination of investment and decisions that will best meet those um, those outcomes, thinking systematically about the UK's infrastructure, not just in these silos that we've created for ourselves. Uh, and I think the data platform that we're talking about, as it evolves, has a, has a real role to play in that. So the last diagram that I'll show you today is, is kind of trying to, in my mind at least, put together all these disparate parts and understand how they can start to function as a system. Because um, if we build our digital twins, as, a, as silos, then we'll never be able to realize the vision of mobility as a service and we'll never be able to optimize for, for what the public need. Um, so you can see at the bottom there, you've got our schema layer. So, you know, we need an ontological view of how our infrastructure operates because only ontologies provide you with the, the multi-dimensional information that you need to properly represent a complex system. If you try and use table structures to do that, you're going you're gonna to run out of room on your on your page pretty quickly. That, as Carl said, then translates nicely into, into graph databasing. So hopefully in the future, our data platform will include a graph element for exactly this um, reason. Um, and then you need that ability to connect into a wide range of other data sources, whether that's widespread standardized IoT. Um, our IoT at the moment is neither widespread nor standardized. So that's a big jump we need to make as an infrastructure organization ourselves. And then crucially that connectivity into, into other third parties and partners so that we don't just know how our infrastructure is operating in isolation, but we know what's happening in the context of the wider country and, and the, the wider sector. Um, 
in the moment, in real time, what's the weather doing? Where's there is an incident? Where's there a diversion? Where's there, where is there a big event? That sort of thing. And then the application layer, crucially, can be built in a million different ways to fit different use cases. So if, if we can get that common data layer, and, and this is probably something I say more often than anything, common data layer allows you to uh, uh, create applications that meet particular user requirements, whether you're trying to model assets and how they behave in the real world, whether you're trying to model how the operations of those assets behave, whether you're trying to understand how we as an organization make decisions around the operations of our assets. There's a whole different level of taxonomy and categorization that we can get to in, in the digital twin world, but we need that common database. We need that common data platform. We need to figure out the ethics and the security and the often standards that make that all practicable. And that's why figuring out how to deliver data platforms effectively, incrementally into infrastructure organizations is, is so important. Um, and I think that's, that's all I've got to say on that topic. Thank you very much for that, guys. Um, so we have got a couple of questions coming in. Um, so this one might be for you, Ian. How did you articulate quantifiable benefit for data collation to build a business case for investment in platform development stroke integration? And then in brackets, maybe answered by our cool bit. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm not going to take credit for that one. Thankfully, a lot of that was done as I before I landed in, in this organization. But we started with an information vision and strategy. So that was working with representatives, senior representatives from across the business, understanding just fundamentally what kind of things they were trying to do and where they were running into blockers because they didn't have the information at hand, um, because they have to do things in spreadsheets and manually where you could actually automate it and really just get in the sense of where the organization is struggling and need help. And then you can always take that like 200 people sort of output and abstract it to, okay, what kind of data platforms do we need in order to realize this? Because chances are for 200 complaints, you probably only need a core of three or four really good things to work and, and it'll fix those problems. And um, so yeah, setting the vision, getting the leadership on board, it's got to be the place to start. Great. And Carl, one for you. Um, you mentioned Hadoop used to be difficult. Could you elaborate on why things are easier now? Uh, <laughs> because you don't have to understand the complexities of how distributed computing works in quite the same way. And you don't have to deal with about a hundred, well, mainly more than a hundred stack, Java stack traces that are totally un, unreadable every day. You used to need to run oper to, to really operate Hadoop in an, a, 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 whether IaaS or, or on-prem before you kind of had platform as a service versions. You genuinely needed to be a, 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 an experienced developer um, it's you couldn't operate it from a typical IT operations team unless you had one with a lot of development cap capability in it. Um, Ian, what kind of cultural change is required to deliver better projects? Mm, I wonder that myself quite a lot. I think um, moving to the agile methodology, moving to this this acceptance of incrementally developing things. Um, not expecting everything to be fixed tomorrow, but but kind of getting buy into like we're creating this thing together. It's going to be something tomorrow. It's going to be a little bit better the day after, a little bit better the day after that, and we need to just drip feed it use cases and build out from that common space. I think is really important. Certainly within a public sector organization, knowing what you want to do in house and and rather than just putting everything out to market, bringing this best of the supply chain into your space to work with you. Um, I think that's that that's a real game changer if we get it right. Kind of creating those shared services, not just within the organization, but across the supplier ecosystem. Because we know that like most people that work for Highways England don't work for Highways England, if that makes sense. Most of them work for Atkins and WSP and, and we need to we need to open our doors to them and get them working in our environment with us. Yeah. So another one, do you also use AI on the edge? I'm not sure whether that's at you, Ian. Oh, well, that's a that's Microsoft's Edge browser that everyone loves. Is that right? <laughs> I think it means on an Edge device. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm being facetious. <laughs> um, um, do you want to answer that one, Carl? We have uh, we've got a data science team that are that are working on that sort of thing, but um, I don't think we've quite got to that point yet. We we, we have a BGSS with other clients. Um, for example, there's. Uh, We've we've done so we've done um, image re uh, object recognition on the Azure Stack Edge uh, device, which effectively 
uh, it, it allows us to use it was very very useful yeah. another one how do you plan to extract a part of the ontology and ignore the rest of it when building a specific dt or is the ultimate goal is to model the whole ontology that is an extremely specific and good <laughs> question um i think certainly what you know i'm a bit of an, an ontology um dilettante so i'm not going to speak for the wider community but the, the need to visualize it and be able to filter it and, and take sort of dynamically take sub ontologies is, is a huge part of this, um, both in order to, you know, facilitate specific digital twin use cases, but just as much to get people to understand what's in there. Because I really believe that if you can't explain the component parts of your ontology in, in plain English to non technical people, then there's very little chance that it actually represents reality. Um, so that that probably didn't answer the question, but I'm not sure that question. I think that is actually an open question. So if, if there's ideas out there, um, I'm really interested to hear about that. And it's, it's definitely an area that we want to invest in. Um, I think we've got time for a couple more questions. There are quite a few coming in. So any that we don't answer today, we will be able to follow up on. So um, what does your team shape look like? Have you been using GDS, so Discovery Alpha Beta Live? Um, None of this is is public facing at this point, um, so we haven't followed the, the the pure GDS approach. I do really like the GDS approach, so particularly as we move to um, surfacing data up to the public and, and creating data feeds that the public can consume, we'll, we'll definitely be will be adopting that. Um, we, we we've been doing MVPs and and then iterating those into production in a in a sort of enterprise agile sort of way that I think Carl can probably answer a bit better than me because I, I kind of just see the, the outputs. <laughs> yeah, so we've been we've been delivering a lot. We use a lot of the principles, obviously, and um, we do a lot of GDS work here, uh, BJSS, and uh, we've brought a lot of those principles. We talked about surface design, about user needs focus, delivery, about delivering quickly. Uh, so whilst we might not have used specifically gone through GDS review points and used Alpha B to discuss uh, discovery Alpha Beta Live in that way. We've brought a lot of that. The team shape, the uh, teams are very multidisciplinary. We believe in, um, so you've got data engineers, data architecture working alongside service designers. We've got um, uh, business change specialists in there. Uh, you've got business analysts, the whole, you know, it's a, it's a classic multi, multidisciplinary team. We're, we're, we're also big believers in T-shaped people. So a lot of those people kind of, so our data engineers tend to do a lot of platform engineering and CI, CD and release engineering as well. Right. I think we've just got time for one more. So what are the next most valuable use cases you want to enable by collating the data in this platform? I think there's, there's something around, um, even before you get into digital twin space or like proper digital twin space, it's just understanding the interaction on the network between traffic flows, incidents or disruptions, external events like weather in particular. And, and the decision-making process that's happening on the ground, you know, in, in creating diversions and, and changing signals and stuff. So we have whole performance analyst teams that are expert at understanding these phenomena, but haven't been given a platform that allows them to combine those different data feeds in order to provide like that, that real kind of tangible understanding of how the network functions as a system. So that, that's what I'm most excited about. Not because I'm ever going to be allowed to do any of that analysis. It's not my job, but just to enable, just because I know the richness of analysis we'll be able to get from that kind of combined data set. Carl, have you got anything you want to add? No, no I think Ian answered that one last time. Hooray. <laughs> <laughs> So there are a few questions that we've not managed to get through, but I'm conscious of, of time. So I'm sure we will follow up after the session. I can get those over to Ian and Carl. Um, we are recording today's session. I am going to send this out. It'll probably be tomorrow that we send this out and with a link to the white paper, I think, Carl. Um, one last thing I do have to add, we are hiring in the data space. So if you do want to join Carl and his team and data engineers, architects, to, um, to check out our website. I hope you enjoy the rest of the festival and thanks again Ian for joining us today. It was actually quite an interesting talk which I didn't really know much about it before I joined the session so yeah, come along.
away learning from you today. So awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. It's been fun.